Thanks for joining me. My guest is Julian Archer from Queensland, Australia. Retired in his 30s after a stint as a very successful businessman. And he's written about his business success, but in ways that you might not expect, at least not to begin with. Julian, thanks for joining me. Thanks, John. Great to be here. You were successful in business. How'd that come about? I'm the child of what you would call serial entrepreneurs. Not because they sold breakfast cereal, but because cereal in the way of one business after another. In okay. fact, the, the last one we sold was uh, 2007, and that was business number 12. So I, I was born into it. Now, you had this, it really was a conversion experience, mm. as I understand it you became very successful in business, but rather than owning the business, business was owning you and leading you away from faith in God. Is that kind of what happened? That's it, yeah. So the businesses were growing rapidly. Um, the last few grew even more and more rapidly, 70% uh, compound per annum. Every year, 70% on the year before and just bang, 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 year after year. We had what we used to describe as a tiger by the tail or a tiger by the ears. You know, if you've got a tiger by the ears, you're holding onto it by the ears, you can't hang on and you can't let go. You're, you're caught. And that's, that's right. how we felt in business. We were just so busy, busy, busy. The challenge that comes with that from a spiritual point of view is that I didn't have the time. I didn't have the focus to maintain that daily saving relationship with Jesus and uh, just got so distracted by everything and started to actually really quite like some of the perks of being wealthy, of, of being in a business that was doing really well, you know, getting quite proud and, and uh, self-sufficient and uh, that sort of thing. And that really wasn't good for me spiritually. So what are you doing today? I travel around the world running a ministry called Faith Versus Finance. Uh, it's really just my testimony. It's, it came out of that, that battle that I had as, a, as an affluent Christian. How do I maintain my relationship with Christ in a materialistic society? Now you must do this because you sense there's a need, like there's a lot of people dealing with what you went through. Is that, is that true? Yeah, look, originally I didn't, I didn't know that. I, I thought I was the only one that was struggling with this. Uh, however, as I started to share with people, I realized, no, this is a, a very common thing. Uh, for Christians ar around the world. So who are the people struggling with matching together their faith with their financial situation? Is it the Bill Gateses and the Jeff Bezoses of the world? How far down the food chain do you have to come to get to that level where people are starting to have that struggle? Yeah, excellent question. The money is actually relative. You know, you can be living in a slum in Calcutta, aspiring to one day own say $100, and put all of your focus on that, just as much as you can be living in Marin County, California, and trying to work out how you're going to get from 500 million to a billion, and it still takes all your focus. So it, it is relative. It can happen to anybody anywhere if our focus comes away from the giver of the gifts onto the gifts. Okay, that's a really important point. So it's really, I think it's really important to point out you're not against money. No. Okay. You don't have an axe to grind with wealthy people. No. Wealth is okay. Mm. It's all right to be rich. Yeah. Is it okay to be really, really rich? It is. Yeah. Okay. So okay. I know wealthy people have often said to me, you know, thank you for not making us feel guilty for being rich or, you know, we feel like we're getting hectored for being wealthy. It's very evident that God's not against wealth. If you look in the Bible, there's some really very rich people. Mm. Uh, I think what's interesting to point out is they were instruments of God. They were His. Why was the wealth given to them? If we go right back to Genesis, we, we have one of those first wealthy men, I guess you would say, and that was Abraham. And it's very clear there. God says to him, He says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing. So we are, as wealthy people or, or as any person who has been entrusted with anything from God, and that doesn't have to be great wealth, we are conduits for God to pass those blessings through. And if we keep passing the blessings through, then we have peace, we have satisfaction, we are greatly blessed because it's more blessed to give than to receive. Everything's great. If we start to dam it up and start to pile it up, that's when we have problems. So, 
I think it was the Clint Murchison Jr. He was the founder of the Dallas Cowboys. And he said that money is like manure. He said, if you spread it around, it does a lot of good. But if you pile it up, it stinks. <laughs> and, and, and so I thought that's quite an interesting illustration. You know, we have, we have manure in our wallets. Yeah. If, we, if we pile it up, it starts to stink. But if you spread it around, it does a lot of good. Yeah. So money's okay. I hear what you're saying is that this challenge of getting wealth out of focus and being owned by what you own could really happen to anybody. It could, yeah, regardless of where you're at financially, materially in life. Do you think wealthy people have a peculiar challenge, an especially difficult challenge when it comes to maintaining a relationship with Jesus? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and Jesus shares that very clearly. He says that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven and and then period full stop that's that's the end of the sentence it, he doesn't go on and say uh, but if you give lots away you'll be okay you know he just says look if you're rich it's going to be tough it's going to be really hard to maintain a, a saving relationship with me and in another place he says you can't serve god and money or mammon as he called it you can't serve those two things i used to you know i can still hear myself thinking this and, and saying this but lord i can serve them both what I'm going to do is I'm going to put all my time and focus and energy into the businesses and make lots of money and then I'll give most of the money to you and that way I'm serving you, God, and money. And, and we can do that, can't we? Well, Jesus says, no, you can't. You can't serve God and money. I think it's important to point out Jesus did not say you can't have both God mm, and money, yeah, right? Yeah. You can have God and have money. You just can't serve God while serving money. That's right. I think it's really interesting that Jesus made it clear. He never said it's really hard for poor people to get into heaven. He never said that. I think those people who don't have money, any money or a lot of money, and you know, most of us, we want to be rich. We, want to, we dream of winning the lottery. You know, that, that's just most people. Wouldn't it be great if I had tons of money? I think, even though those things are written in the Bible really very clearly, most people wouldn't stop to realize that wealthy people have a special challenge when it comes to maintaining a relationship with God, a vibrant, saving relationship with God, and having a, a bulging wallet in your pocket. Most people just wouldn't get that, would they? No. I was uh, reading an author who wrote oh, probably about 150 years ago now, and she wrote in there that the, we, we pray for people in need who are stricken down with health problems or financial problems or whatever it is, and she says, this is as it should be. You know, we must pray for these people. But then she says, but our most fervent prayers should be re reserved for those who have been placed in a prosperous position because these men are in the greatest danger of losing their soul. Hey, that's interesting, isn't it? It is. These yeah. wealthy people are in the greatest danger of losing their soul. Mm. Why? Because there's something about money that gets a hold of your heart. And the more... The more you own, the more you are owned. So, you know, if you, if you own a lot of real estate, a lot of assets, a lot of investments, whatever it is, then it requires a lot of time and energy to maintain them, to insure them, to protect them, to try and make sure they don't lose value or even to make them increase in value. It can become a 24-7 situation where you're trying to care for this stuff that you think you own, but it actually owns you. Do you think people can be wealthy enough so that they feel like they don't really need God? I remember working with a group of Bible workers in a part of California that was pretty well off, really pretty well off. And uh, they were canvassing the neighborhood and they would come back, didn't matter which Bible worker, and they would say, everyone is telling us we don't have needs. Mm -hmm. And so if you look in California, New York City, there's not a surge in interest and faith in God, but you go to poor parts of the world and there are people who are reaching out to God there really is a, is a correlation there, isn't there? Mm, absolutely. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus said, because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. How does somebody who's doing pretty well financially keep in mind their dependence upon God? How do you do that? They've, they've got to understand a number of principles. One is that it's actually all God's. It's not theirs. They are there as stewards to, to care for it. And, and if they're Christians, they will believe that. They will, they will know that. Uh, the challenge is then taking it from the head to the heart. So you know, yes, it's all God's. And, and you'll hear people say, 
If God took it all away tomorrow, that's okay with me. But often in their heart, they're going, oh, gee, I hope he doesn't. <laughs> I'm actually pretty attached to this lifestyle. It's pretty good. So the, one of the ways of keeping the, the balance there is through giving, through seeing needs and being used by God to fill those needs. There's something about giving that helps to, to level us and, and, and remind us of, of where we are from. You've given away a lot of money and time, I take it. It's all relative. Sure. But yeah, we have, we sure. have given a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So you've yeah. given away a lot of money. So you've written some checks here and there and bigger checks than some people have written and probably not as big as many others have written. What does it do for you? How do, how do you feel when you're, when you're writing that check and you're saying, I'm committing this to God, I'm investing in God, or even not even writing the check. When you do your budget and you say, whatever the outcome of our business this year, X is going to God. Mm -hmm. uh, as a Christian philanthropist, particularly when you were dealing with large sums and thriving businesses, was there ever any wrestling? Was there ever a time where you say, oh, we could fly first class to London instead? Or, or, or what did this do for you on the inside? Yeah, look, we, in, in the latter business years, when we were writing most of the checks, um, it was an interesting thing because we didn't have to sacrifice one bit of our lifestyle to write those checks. Right. So the checks were getting bigger and bigger, but there was still zero sacrifice. It gets to a point, or it can get to a point, where you just get sick of writing checks. It's just like, I, I have no heart in this game. I have no flesh in this game. Somebody sends an email, yep, here's a check, done, back to business. Yep, write them another check, or you write them a check, I'm busy. You know? And the heart's not in it anymore. Interesting. Uh, so you've got to maintain that daily relationship with God and with others for the heart to still be in it. Otherwise, it's just all, it's just all numbers. Okay, we'll talk more about this. We've got, we've got a little time left. I, I want to talk about Julian Archer, the person, a little bit about where you're from, some of your, your, your past, a colourful past. You've had an interesting background, uh, raised in a very interesting country. Uh, not everybody has to live among poisonous snakes and, and deadly spiders and spiny echidnas and wallabies. You know, for people outside of Australia, that's a great curiosity for Australians. It's like, really, you want to talk about that? But we will. We've got a moment before we go to the break. So let, let, let's go back. Tell me, tell me a little bit about where you're from and what your upbringing was like. Take okay. me back to the beginning. Um, we're going to have to talk more after the break. You know, this is... Oh, sure. <laughs> let's just get this Let's go rolling. back to the beginning. Let's go back a generation. My father was raised in a church where he had to go to church 11 times a week as a kid. Eight, eight to 11, at least eight times, 11 times in a busy week. That's a lot. That's a lot of going to church. He was also the homebrew kid, which means that it was his job in the family to make all the beer for his own family and for the relatives, the aunts and the uncles and them as well, okay? Oh, no, let's get this straight. He's going to, he's going to church 11 times a week and brewing beer. That's right, and drinking too much of it himself as a kid. As a kid. Okay. He gets to 14. He says, I've had enough. I never want to set foot in a church again in my life. Okay. I only know of one solution because he'd already tried everything to get out of going to church. Right. You know, he, he's tri he tried it all eight times a week. He goes to his uncle's farm. He gets some gel ignite, that's like dynamite, yep. some fuses. He takes it home, he hides it, and he says, I'm going to blow up my church. I'm going to blow up my church. We've got to hear more about this. We will in just a moment. I'm John Bradshaw from It Is Written, inviting you to join me for 500. Nine programs produced by It Is Written, taking you deep into the Reformation. This is the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. We'll take you to Wittenberg and to Belgium, to England, to Ireland, to Rome, to the Vatican City, and introduce you to the people who created the Reformation, who pushed the Reformation forward. We'll take you to sites all throughout Europe where the Reformers lived and in some cases died. We'll bring you back to the United States and take you to a little farm in upstate New York and show you how God spread the Reformation here. Don't miss 500. You can own the 500 series on DVD. Call us on 888-664-5573 or visit us online at itiswritten.shop. Thanks for joining me. My guest is author, international speaker, Julian Archer. Julian, 
you've you retired from business young, dedicated your life to ministry. But in learning about who Julian Archer is, how God led you to this place where you've dedicated yourself to ministry, you've started telling me a story about your background. And a moment ago, your dad, at 14 years of age, was going to blow up a church. Now, when your dad told you that story, did you say, ah, dad, I can't believe it? Or did you say, okay, is your dad a bit of a character? Very much a bit of a character. In fact, he went to school that day and told his friend, his best friend, what he was going to do that night, blow up the church. Oh, really? And his friend, knowing who Ray Archer was, because Ray Archer was the kid who in grades eight, nine, and 10 received the cuts that's, you know, wrap across the knuckles with a cane. Yeah. On average, for those three years, he received the cuts once a day. Ooh. So his friend knew that if Ray Archer said that he was going to blow up his church that night, he was going to blow up his church he that night. He was going to blow up the church. And so his friend went to the principal and told the principal. The principal told the police. The police came to the school and took Dad away. So what was it about your dad's upbringing, for instance, that he could access Jell Ignite and, and knew what to do with it? The Jell Ignite was on his uncle's farm, so they used to have it for blowing stumps out of the ground, tree stumps and different things. So it was a fairly common thing to have explosives back then. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he, he was very creative sort of a kid. He was a bit of a homemade scientist. He knew how to use dynamite, some of those sorts of things. And creative, that's a good description. If my son blew up a church or was attempting to blow up a church, I don't know, I'd be calling him creative, but <laughs> yeah, that's evidently, right. evidently your dad was creative. He was a church planter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he blew was. It out of the <laughs> so he was gonna blow up the church mm. and the police arrived at the house. What in the world happened? They said to him, son, you know, what's the situation here? And he explained. My parents forced me to go to church eight times a week or up to 11 times a week, and I hate it, and I want to blow up the church. And so what they actually did is they took him home and took the parents away. Well, they took the parents away? Not far, not far. (laughs) But they showed the parents the the jelly night, the dynamite, and said, do you realize what your son was going to do with this tonight? And they had no idea. And so the police said, you need to back off on religion. You need to just give this kid a break. And I think they probably did back off a little bit, but soon after Dad left home, he'd had enough. That was, he'd had enough religion for the rest of his life. So was it the religion or was it a particularly strict church? And it's probably best that we don't name the denomination sure. because we don't want to give anybody ideas here or, or, or harm anybody's reputation. But what, what, what was it about the church? It was, he just hated going or they were really strict? What was it? Yeah, very, very strict in, okay. in a lot of different ways. And of course, going to church eight times a week is part of that. Sure. And he saw it more as a punishment than a blessing. You know, that was it. And so... He left home, still drinking too much. So he left home young and drinking. Yeah, yeah, not a good combination. No. No, and uh, moved in with his older brother, uh, which also wasn't a good situation there either. Uh, His older brother went to prison for some things and uh, dad missed out on the prison time, but he was drinking too much. And uh, met my mum when he was uh, about 18. Oh yeah. And they got married at 19 had my younger sister and myself. We were 11 months apart. We were quite close together. And Dad had, by this stage, uh, or or around this time, started up a small business, a refrigeration business, because he had uh, sort of got his trade in in refrigeration mechanics, and he he wanted to have his own business. This was his thing. He was going to go out on his own, which he did. And he bought himself a welder for welding steel. And a friend of his said to him, Ray, can you make me a bench press? This was late 60s. So the bodybuilding, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrigno, the Incredible Hulk, all this sort of stuff was just kicking off in California. Uh, And and it was floating across the Pacific and there were some people in Brisbane going, hey, yeah, we want big muscles too, you know. And and so Dad welded up this bench for his friend. It's one of these ones where you push the weights away from your chest and sold it to his friend and made a small profit and thought, hey, that's pretty good. Ah. I'll make another one. An entrepreneur was born. That's right. And I'll make another one. In my spare time when I'm not doing refrigeration work, I'm going to make this gym gear. And before you know it, he had a business called Archer Bodybuilding Equipment, where he was selling all sorts of different pieces of gym gear. And the bodybuilding business was taking off. The the industry was taking off in, in Australia. And he was supplying a lot of the gear. And then he thought, oh, man, I'm making all this gear. I can get it cheap because I make it myself. Why don't I open a gym? And so he and mum opened a gym, and before you know it, it had a thousand members. And they're like, cool, let's open another one. So they opened another gym, another thousand members. And then they realized that they could actually make more money out of selling protein drinks than gym memberships. And so they said, we need to open a health food store. And so they opened a health food store. So here they are, 24 years of age, 
they've in the last four years, four or five years, they've opened, they've got the refrigeration business, a bodybuilding equipment business, two gymnasiums and a health food store. So they were running all of these things at the same time? Simultaneous. Oh, really? 18 hours a day and, and two kids, throw in a couple of kids as well, yeah. they have the children. Their business lives were successful. You look at them, success. Five years, five businesses, going well, excellent. Their marriage was absolutely hell. You can imagine. Their marriage was just totally shot and they had to make a decision between marriage and business. And I thank God that they chose marriage at that stage. Not everybody would have, you know. No, no, it's pretty attractive to try and hang in there with the money and, and the and they success. Were making, they were making plenty or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good money, good businesses. Yeah, right on the front edge of the bodybuilding industry. Got in at the right time, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they, they sold four of the businesses. They kept the health food store and they moved to what we call the bush. Oh yeah. And we bought a, a little 33 acre property. That's right, 33 acres is little. Yeah, well, one neighbour had 15 and the other one had 2,000. So, oh, so you right, know, right. relatively speaking. That's right. So they were cattle properties on, on both sides and we were in the middle and we became hippies. That was it. They just turned their back on the city, turned their back on society and money. We were a little bit late because it was, by this time it was 1974. Oh, yeah. And the hippies all happened in the 60s, but mum and dad were busy in the 60s. And so, you know, <laughs> we had to do it a bit later. Yeah, we'll get around to that. That's right. And so, you know, self-sufficiency and all that. We hey, were. hey, so why'd they keep the health food store and not the gym or, or the refrigeration business or whatever? I think probably proximity because the health food store was actually about halfway between where we moved to and Brisbane. It was west of the city anyway. Uh, and so it was something that they could still access. And, and mum or dad would go into the city each day, Monday to Friday, to run that health food store. And we would stay at home, and I was about four or five at this time, my sister five or six, uh, and we just grew up as hippies out there in the bush. So how does, how does church going, church hating, home brew, brewing, you know, scallywag of a kid who's wanting to blow up a church, how do you drift into being a hippie, this hippie, self-sufficient hippie lifestyle? What, what, what drew him to that? Just a bit of wanting to turn, turn away from it all. Just, just put it all in the past, start afresh, uh, not just change suburbs into a new home, new business, new whatever, but actually just go bush. We call it a tree change in Australia. You've got a sea change or a tree change. We did a tree change. The reason I ask it is it's, I think, very relevant considering what's going to happen next in your, in, your, in your parents' story and in yours. So tell me about this hippie lifestyle. What did that look like in Australia? I can't tell you too much what it looked like because there wasn't a lot of clothes involved or, you know. Oh, <laughs> so, really? Yeah, we, were, we moved into, onto this 33-acre property. We have no neighbours, so no one's looking, you know. Right. And we moved into a shed that was eight feet wide and 14 feet long. No running water, no electricity, you know, no comforts. Wow. Okay, so big change yeah. from where we had been living. And of course, if you've got no running water and electricity, you can't have a washing machine, etc., etc. So clothes, yeah. just you know, a bit tricky to wash them. And who needs them? Who needs them? Yeah. So it, it was it, it was a bit of a different lifestyle um, from that point of view. But of course, growing up in it, you think it's just normal. Yeah. The, you know, that that's how you lived. Yeah. You, you don't have to wear clothes all the time. Um, and that's how we grew up, trying to grow our own food. For mum and dad, it was probably very stressful. For us as kids, it was a pretty fancy, well, loose, fancy I mean, food. your mum wasn't stressing about ironing anybody's clothes. Well, that, that's, one <laughs> that's right. We had, we had clothes when we went to town, don't get me wrong. Like we did own clothes, yeah, right, yeah, and the health okay. food store and all that. So, so by now, your parents are hippies. They're living this alternative lifestyle. They're running a health food store. Their life changed mm. really dramatically. Mm. Your dad hated religion. Yep. wanted to blow up the church. If conversion is a turnaround in a person's life, he turned around. Mm. How'd that happen? A guy called Harry is how that happened. A guy called Harry Walker would come into that health food store every day and buy a loaf of bread. And now he had no children at home. It was only Harry and his wife. And they liked bread evidently. Well, yeah, we have no idea to this day what they did with that bread because you couldn't eat a full loaf a day of this heavy, healthy bread. But that's what he did. Every day he came in and every day he would come to buy his loaf of bread and he'd say, oh, Ray, how's, how's the house building going? Or, or Delphine, how are the kids? You know, and he always had this personal relationship happening. At the time, Dad was building a house, which took him seven years to build because he was making it out of sandstone. And a lot of the sandstone he was actually cutting out of the ground himself. Good grief, really. <laughs> yeah, so wow. it took years, you know, yeah. sandstone and big logs. It was quite an interesting home. So Harry would come in and say, how's that house going? And, and that sort of thing. And he was building a relationship. We had no idea 
what Harry was doing. We just thought he was a friendly customer. And one day Harry came into the shop and he said, Ray, you won't believe it. There's a guy coming to town and he is talking about how the Egyptians built their pyramids out of stone. Do you want to come along? Come on, he's talking yeah. to a man who's building his building own house out of, out of stone. stone. That's right. Fantastic. Yeah. And so dad goes, yeah, we'll come. And so mum and dad, myself and Kathy, we all pile in our old pickup and we drive down to Ipswich, was the town where this was all happening. And we listen to a guy talk about the Egyptians and a little bit about how they built out of stone. But there wasn't a whole, a whole lot of that, but there was, there was some of that. And uh, we met some great people, went back the next week, same people, different topic, loved it, and kept going week after week and, uh, and learning a lot, not just about the Egyptians, but about God as well. So how did your dad take to this? He's going to meetings about the Egyptians building pyramids and suddenly he realises, you know, they're talking about God here. Mm. And the last time I had anything to, God, to do with God, I was, I was attempting to blow up his house. Mm. But now your dad's attitude evidently was pretty different. Yeah, very interesting what friendship can do. And, and when the gospel is being presented as the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the, the life-changing, love-centred gospel of Jesus Christ. And so they kept going week after week. Finally, the series finished and we went back to the bush and Harry kept coming in every day and buying that loaf of bread. Oh, yeah. And a couple of months later, Harry comes in and mum's in the shop and he says, Delphine, there's this couple coming to town and they're teaching about vegetarian cooking. Would you like to come along and learn how to cook vegetarian food? And she's like, oh, sounds interesting, but I'll talk to Ray. So she comes home and says, Ray, Harry has invited us to this vegetarian cooking thing. Do you want to go? Now, Dad, at this stage, is an ex-bodybuilder, okay? And this is back in the 60s when he was bodybuilding. And back then, they had no idea that there was protein anywhere else except red meat. Right. And so the idea was, if you wanted to put on 10 pounds, you ate 50 pounds of red meat, and it somehow miraculously transferred and became muscle on you instead of muscle on the cow. And so that's how he was thinking. And he's like, no way. I have no interest in vegetarian food. And Mum said, but a lot of our customers are vegetarians. Right. And if we learn how to cook vegetarian food, we'll be able to sell more stuff. Dad's like, sign me up. Where do we, give me a pen. Where do I, I want to join this, you know. And so he and we, you know, we all pile into the old pickup again and we drive down to Ipswich. We walk into this room where they're about to do this cooking demonstration and we look around and we go, no way. The exact same people who were interested in Egypt were interested in vegetarian cooking. In a city, 100,000 people. Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought? Yeah. And so we're like, we're amongst friends again. Great. God is working things out. God's working things out and He does work things out. We'll find out how in just a moment. More and more people are watching It Is Written TV for the first time. They're watching their favorite It Is Written episodes, listening to inspiring sermon series, and much more. They're watching them here, here, and even here. See for yourself why people are turning to It Is Written TV to watch their favorite Christian programs live and on demand. Watch It Is Written TV for free on Roku and Apple TV or visit itiswritten.tv. Thanks for joining me today. Julian, we left off just a moment ago. Mum and Dad had been to uh, a, a seminar learning about the Egyptians building their great structures. Now Harry's invited them to something else vegetarian cooking program. They arrive and they're among friends. Dad didn't want to go to that program to begin with, but now he's back. Does he realize at this stage that he's among churchy folks? Yeah, I think that's starting, it's starting to dawn. Uh, and, and that's where there's a bit of hesitation coming. But they're such good people and they just loved us so much. Yeah. We must have been like, the, I don't know, their favorite hippie family or something. And they, they just loved us. And so we learned how to cook vegetarian food and we went back to the bush. And Harry kept coming into the shop every day and buying a loaf of bread. Good old Harry. He was an engineer in the railways. He was no, he was no special, you know, super disciple or, or anything like this. He just wanted to tell people about Jesus and, and he'd chosen us and we thank God he did. And so he kept coming in there every day. And one day he said to my dad, he said, Ray, would you like to come along to church? Well, we know Dad's experience. He'd been to church eight times a week when he was a kid, up until the age of 14. He had had more church than most people who go to church for 80 years yep. he'd had in that first 14 years. 
And he was like, how am I going to get out of this? And he thought, I know what I'll do. I'll ask Harry wh what day he goes to church. All right. Because you see, Sunday was the only day that we never went to town. We, we just, that was our family day at home and we never went to the city. And so he says to Harry, Harry, I, I'd love to, but what, what day do you go to church? And Harry's like, oh, Saturday mornings. And Dad's like, what? Saturday mornings? Who does that? Yeah, who does that? And so he, he says, yeah, Saturday mornings. And Dad's like, that was my only excuse. Okay, Harry, yeah, we'll come this Saturday. What time? Where at? And we get all the details. So because Saturday was the, it was the only day that we actually went to the city as a whole family because we went Saturday mornings and purchased all of our groceries for the next week. Right. And so we all pile in the old pickup. We drive down to town. We do all of our grocery shopping at the supermarket. We drive back to the church and we've got a problem because our old pickup is old. It's like old, old. And the doors don't lock. And we've got a week's worth of groceries that we can't afford to have stolen. Right. What are we going to do? Well, we're obviously, we're just going to have to take them into church. And so we pack up all of our groceries in beer cartons. They're the only cartons that we've got. And so we, we take that our groceries, we walk into church. Dad, Mum, Kath and myself, all with boxes of groceries, we walk in. Where should we put these, Harry, you know? <laughs> um, uh, under the seat. And so we, we put our groceries under the seat there and we all go around and we sit on them because we're not sure, you know, someone might take these groceries where <laughs> even now we want to look after them. And there we are, sitting there in church. Dad would have, you know, a smell of cigarettes, um, alcohol, because uh, he's still drinking way too much. Right. Um, we look very different. We're barefoot. We are clothed, but we're barefoot. Barefoot. <laughs> barefoot. Dad's got a long beard. I've got long hair, even though I'm a boy. You know, it's, it, we're a hippie family. Very different to everybody else around us in church in the mid 70s, you know. And I, I, I give you all those details simply because nobody in that church ever said anything about any of those things. Right. They just loved us. Yeah. They just loved us. They said, come on in. And, you know, as, as we're sitting there and we look around over the, and we went back the next week and the next week and we started to see some things and we started to go, you know, I wonder why anybody else doesn't have this harmful addiction or, or whatever. And so what do we do? We ask Harry. We've got a friend who we know and we trust. And Harry explains some of these different things to us about how to live a better life, how to live a healthier life full of hope and, and that sort of thing. And they loved us to Jesus. Mum and Dad became Christians very soon thereafter. How about that? What happened to Harry? Harry lived to, to a ripe old age, into his 90s, and he, he passed away. But you know, Harry used to tell people, he never told us this, but he used to tell people that the Archer family were the stars in his crown. Nice. You know, and and we, we thank God for Harry. And of course, now it's up to us to be a Harry to other people and, and tell them the blessing that we were given. And of course, Harry uh, had his funeral and I went to his funeral as our family did, of course. And it was interesting, I was at the funeral and this is the best part of 30 years after Harry used to come in and, and buy his loaf of bread. And I met a young lady there uh, and well, I got chatting to her at Harry's funeral and I said, oh, and where are you from, what do you do? And how did you know Harry? And she said, I used to work down at the supermarket down the road. Uh -huh. And Harry used to come in there and buy stuff like nearly every day. No, come on. Yeah. <laughs> I would see him buying his things. And even if my queue was the longest queue to come through my checkout, he would wait. He would get on the end of that queue so that he could talk to me. Interesting, eh? Harry was just the most lovely, lovely man, wasn't he? And I agreed, of course. You know, he changed my life. And I exp explained the story. And she said... At Harry's funeral, she said, you know, Harry would probably really like it if I became a Christian, wouldn't he? You know, isn't it interesting? Our legacy goes on. Yeah. We're just called to be faithful. Yeah. We're called to love people and let Jesus work with them. That's a wonderful, wonderful story about a man who changed your life. Mm. Now, God, God changed your life, but he was used by God to go into that health food store day after day after day after day and just wait for God to open the door. Yep. And he did. Yeah. Fantastic. So, so you became a Christian, your family became Christian, and uh, stay in the bush or, or what happened at the health food store? Uh, obviously, the business, you, you described your mum and dad as serial entrepreneurs, so more business opportunities came mm. along. 
Yeah, so one of the things about being hippies and, and being self-sufficient is that you want to grow all of your own food. And so we would say, hey, we need an orange tree. We would plant 30 seeds in the hope that one or two would grow. Right. And sometimes 30 would grow. All right. And we're like, ah, what are we going to do with the extra 28 trees? Got you to know? sell them, right? Got to sell them. And so we got our old pickup, that faithful pickup. We loaded all these trees onto the back in pots, onto the back of it, drove down to the local freeway and put up a little sign. Archers fruit trees. Well, the, this turns into a small business called Archers Fruit Trees, where it actually has not just a roadside stall, but an actual property with 214 different varieties of fruit and nut trees. And so th this business grew there and, and people would come from all over the state because they knew the Ray and Delphine would have it. If it wasn't any, in any other nursery, these guys well, would have it. All right. But in that process, they uh, are just becoming, so when they finish the health food store soon after becoming Christians, they start up this, this uh, nursery and they go, we've got to tell people about Jesus mm -hmm. because th it's just completely lo changed their lives. And well, how do you do that? And dad goes, well, I guess I've, I get on a plane and I go to Egypt and I take some photos and then I come back and I put an ad in the paper saying, come along to the local hall that I'll hire and hear Ray Archer talk about Egypt. He was becoming a lay evangelist. Yeah, because that's all he knew. Yeah. That's how he had met Christ. Yep. And he's like, well, that's what I have to do. And so that's what we did. And mum, what did she do? Vegetarian cooking programs. Fantastic. <laughs> okay? Yeah. And so we hired the local hall and we say, come along and hear the Archer Report. You know, big name, you know, the Archer Report. Uh, it's really just this hippie who's found Jesus, you know, and, and people would come along. They came out, eh? They came, they yeah. came, and, they, and they, they became Christians. It was, it was incredible, yeah. you know? And Dad would say, oh, here's a picture of me on a camel in front of the pyramids, and, you know, this was cool. And, uh, you know, just this very personal story of telling people about the land where Jesus went to as, as a child and Israel and all the rest of it. But we finally ran out of towns. So we had done all the towns that we could reach from where our fruit tree nursery was. So your dad was pretty serious about this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this was, this was like every Sunday night. And he was financing this himself. Yeah, yeah, from, from the nursery business, yeah. Right. And so he uh, and mum, they ran out of towns, and they're like, we've still got to tell pe people about Jesus. We will have to go further afield, but we can't because we're tied down to this business. So they said, we're going to have to sell this business. And then they're like, but if you sell the business, we're going to run out of money. Hmm. And, and so they go, well, what we need to do is we need to choose one type of fruit or nut tree that we can s sell in, a, in the future. And, and that'll keep us going financially. But they've got a catalog with you know, 214 different fruit and nut trees. How do you choose which one might have a future? Well, for Christians, new Christians, it's very easy. They just get down on their knees with their catalog and the pen and they go, Lord, is it apples? No. Bananas? No. Cherimoyas? No. Durians? No, it wouldn't be durians. You know, I think it could be. You think it could oh, be durians? Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> You're a durian lover. Oh, yes. <laughs> Who isn't? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so they, they go through this list. Now, now, it wasn't that God was speaking to them from sure. the sky or anything, but God had given them experience in their lives. They understood these different fruit nut tree varieties, and they realized that there is one that has more potential than others, and that's the olive tree. And so they keep these olive trees, they sell the nursery, they put the olive trees on a trailer behind the car, and we head off to another, another bigger city so that we've got more people that we can tell. Plant the olive trees in the backyard and start telling people. Hey, it's people. interesting. We know where this goes because it, the, the business becomes successful. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's okay that we know that we'll, we'll continue down that road. But look what, look what your family had done. Your mum and dad said the business is so we can finance yep. evangelism. Yeah. Right. And then there's no wonder God blessed the business and they got it into their heads early. Business success equals investment in ministry. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So they adopted or they chose olives. Yeah. And what was the olive industry like in Australia at the time? There wasn't one. Basically, 99% of our olive products were imported. And so it was a very unusual choice. Yeah. Uh, and they... I guess they looked at the climate, they saw the opportunities for olive groves and that sort of thing, uh, but didn't really know very much about it. So it was, it was very much a God-led decision. It wasn't, it wasn't the obvious thing for them to decide, but that's what God led them to, and so they did that. And they were successful? Yeah, so they, well, they kept doing these missions, uh, and then the thing was they would run out of territory there, 
and then they would have to move again. So they would dig up these olive trees. <laughs> <laughs> really? And move on. Relocate and, them. Yeah, and they're like, we're going to kill these trees. Yeah. You know, this is our retirement plan, <laughs> and we're going to kill it. And so they bought a little farm, and they planted these trees on the farm and said, okay, rest in peace. You know, <laughs> you can stay there now. Right. We're, we're going to go off. And they headed off doing lay evangelism, and uh, they didn't have much money. They, they were really, you know, hand to mouth because they were so generous. Whenever they got money, they gave it away, and, you know, um, they moved to Sydney, and to help support themselves financially they started to sell small olive trees out of their backyard and uh, and that was the beginning of a nursery that we turned into a, a company called Olives Australia and uh, that was the next stage. You, you can't separate from this faithfulness to God and activity and mission, commitment to mission mm. and the blessing of God followed that. Yeah. Hey that's fantastic. Now we've just got a moment before we go to the break your participation in the family business was, was just a natural thing, it was always going to happen, or you weighed it up. How did you get involved in, in business yourself? You, I mean, you could have become a pilot or an engineer or, or a hippie or, or anything. How did you choose business? I guess I, it was somewhat in my blood. You know, I grew up in it, so I was always working for Dad, and that was just the worst thing. You know, as, as a kid working for your dad, oh, man, I'd, I could work for anybody else, but working for your parents, you know, or, you know. As it turned out, I then went off to college and did a teaching degree to become a teacher. I graduated from that on a Sunday, and on Monday I went back into business. <laughs> so, so back to the olives. So mum and dad at that stage were still selling these olive trees in the backyard, and I said, hey, I'm about to get married to my wonderful wife, Melinda. How about we go and live on that property where those olive trees are growing and run the business from there? And that was the next stage of the journey. Yeah, the next stage of the journey, if, well, let's jump ahead at least one stage, is that you decide to pull back from business because um, business or money or your priorities or your focus was starting to strangle you spiritually and you realize that. Mm. So when we come back, let's talk about your turnaround, how you met God and how that's impacted your life and the lives of others as well. We'll talk about that with Julian Archer in just a moment. Planning for your financial future is a vital aspect of Christian stewardship. For this reason, It Is Written is pleased to offer free planned giving and estate services. For information on how we can help you, please call 800-992-2219. Call today or visit our website, hislegacy.com. Call 800-992-2219. Welcome back. My guest is Julian Archer from Queensland, Australia, who's dedicated his life to ministries and not only an international speaker, but an author and a successful businessman who backed away from business to dedicate his life wholeheartedly to serving God. Not that one cannot wholeheartedly serve God in business, but for you, it became a real challenge that you decided was detrimental to your spiritual well-being. Walk us through that. Yeah, so, so we started up this, this little business with a big name, Olives Australia. God had led us to the olive tree. It was quite clear from, from the way that we were led into that industry that God knew what was coming. Within four years of starting this little tiny business, it was the largest olive tree nursery in the world. And we had a number of olive businesses all related to the olive industry. We had equipment businesses, olive oil, consulting. We ran tours in different parts of the world for olive growers. All in four years, it just went zoom like that. Then, uh, my wife and I spent a bit of time doing some humanitarian work, but while we were doing that, my father found a thing called olive leaf extract, which is a herbal medicine, and he decided that the world needed this. Long story short, within three years of my wife and I getting back from working in another country, we were exporting this product to 25 countries around the world. Mm. And we could see God's hand in so many actions of those businesses, not just the founding of them and choosing olives, but in shipping issues, in manufacturing issues, in marketing issues, all the rest of it. And so we could, we could just see God growing this business like this. And of course, the, most of the profits from the business were going out into his work. But there was a very interesting thing happening inside my heart. And normally you would think that if you're, if you're in this and everything's going so well and the blessings are happening and God's making us rich and all that sort of stuff, 
the relationship with God is going to be going, woohoo, you know, mm -hmm. we're on our way up. Sure. But the reality was that the more I was blessed, the less I felt that I needed God. The prouder I became of what I had done. In biblical terms, I became a bit of a Pharisee because I started to become quite judgmental of other people who weren't as successful. They must not be doing things right or they mustn't be as good as me. All this sort of stuff started to happen inside my heart. And my relationship with Jesus, my first love, as it's called in the Bible, started to go like this. When did you become or how did you become aware that that's what was happening? Because I imagine it could be kind of intoxicating. You can tell yourself you're OK when you're really not. How do you know? What did you see about yourself that said, hey, this is an alarm bell I actually hear? Mm. Yeah, look, the first alarm bell that I, that I see uh, and have, ha saw at that time is my time with Jesus gets cropped. So my morning time, morning study time, whenever it is in the day, it, it starts to get shorter and shorter and shorter because I just don't have the time. And I don't have the priority. I don't make it a priority. I put the business and the emails and, and all the rest ahead. So, you know, wake up in the morning, first thing you check is communications that have come in from overnight. You know, we're exporting to 25 countries. It doesn't stop. It's 24 seven. And good news, bad news. Blah, 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 blah. And that's, that's the first thing that, that enters my head. Instead of, Lord, thank you for this new day. Can we spend time together? I just really want to know more about you and I want to learn to love you more. It's all about money. It's all about what issues happened overnight. Somewhere back there you said, I've got to do something about this. Yep. How easy was it to come to the decision that you did really to back away from being a full-time businessman? That's a, that's a pretty radical decision. I think it needs to be said, you're not advocating that everybody should do this. No. No, no, no. You're not saying again, we talked about this earlier, you're not against wealth. You're not, it, to be rich isn't to be bad or anything like that. That's, that's all okay. But it was damaging you spiritually. Mm. This must have been, I would expect, a, a, a huge decision, maybe a frightening decision to say, that's it, I'm not going to put all my energies into business and wealth. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, we're already supporting a number of different you know, ministries and things around the world. Um, and so it became a bit more of a decision of, you know, I need to spend more time doing those things than these things. Uh, from a divine leading point of view, my mother had retired. My father was saying, hey, I think I'll retire too. And they asked me, what do I want to do? Do I want to keep reading this, sorry, running this business? Um, which is like, you know, holding a tiger by the ears. You can't hang on, you can't let go. And I was like, no, you know, in five years time, I don't see myself here. I see myself somewhere else. I, this is messing with me in, uh, in ways that I don't really understand yet. And, uh, and I really don't like where it's taking me, what it's making me. Uh, so I see myself somewhere else. So we actually sold that last business uh, right on the eve of the global financial crisis, late 2007, as, as we're heading into 2008. The timing was good. God's timing. Yeah, and we, uh, we basically sort of walked away from it. I stayed on for two years to help the new owners and they got a very good business. You know, to this day, it's still running beautifully for them. So that's, that's great. You know, we're very happy about that. But I knew that I needed to make a, a life change, a, a major shift because I had tried to do, well, I'll do 20% less in business and 20% more on the other things and all this sort of stuff. It, it didn't work for me. For my personality, I, I'm in boots and all. Wherever I am, I've got to be in there. And so I couldn't divide my time as I would have liked. Speaking of boots and all, you've embraced ministry pretty wholeheartedly. And now you, you travel around the world speaking. It, it takes you some very interesting places. You meet some very interesting people, not only Christians, mm. people from all walks of life, and it's given you great insight into the challenges that money can bring. Mm. Obviously, it can bring, bring blessing, but we, re we remember what Paul wrote to Timothy, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So your book is really, uh, the title's fantastic, Help, I've Been Blessed. Uh, what brought her out about the writing of the book? It was about that time with the selling of the business and that sort of thing. You know, we were already financially secure. And then all of a sudden there's this big business sale that comes in on top of that. And it's everybody's dream. Sure. And, and, and mine too, to, to some degree. But I knew that it was just compounding my problem. <laughs> and so... I just sat down. I said, Lord, I've got a bit of time now. I, I've got to nut this out. We have to sort this out. And I just went back over my life, over the battles that I had faced, this faith versus finance battle, looking at it from all different angles to try and work out what the solution was. And I came to some realizations as I went through that, that led me to actually be converted to, to a heart conversion. It but that was never meant to be a book. That was just my notes of, of where things were at. But then I thought, 
why don't I leave this for my sons because then they won't make the same spiritual mistakes that I've made. And so I sort of put it into a chapterish sort of format, L short stories, very easy to read. And then at, when I had done that, I was convicted, Julian, you've got to make this a book. And I was like, no way, this is too personal. Uh, this is not going to be a book. And so for two years, I sat on it and said, no, no book, no book. This is for me and my sons. That's it. Uh, and then God had other ideas. God had other ideas. The Holy Spirit keeps prompting. And I went, OK, Lord, I'll put it out there. In the meantime, I had been converted. And isn't, it's funny when you're converted that your reputation and stuff doesn't matter anymore. Sure. You know, you, you go, Lord, you're my defense. This is my story. This is where, where well, it's whether where you led me or where I allowed myself to go on my journey to you. And maybe it will help some other people who are fighting the same battle. So Jesus talked about this, you know, it's so hard for a rich man to get into heaven, a rich woman for that matter, a rich person, harder than it is for a camel to get through the eye of a needle. So clearly lots of people are facing what you faced. And even if it's the, the woman earning minimum wage at a fast food restaurant, she's plotting her course, a college student who's plotting her course through life, and money is a major factor, right? Because you've got to have money for retirement and money to raise a family. So it's not just the wealthy that deal with money becoming a god or, or, or this thing getting out of proportion. You've got a whole book here. It's, it's, it's a wonderful book, and it deals with some sound principles and solid advice, but share some counsel in the few minutes we have with people who are saying, you know, it's out of focus in my life. It's out of whack in my life. I've got to get it back. Where did they start? What did they do? The, the natural instinctive place to start is to go, well, I've got all these desires for wealth and riches and all the rest in my heart, and I've got to get rid of them. And normally those desires come about in the form of I really want this sort of a car, or I'd like to live in that sort of a house, or go on these sorts of vacations. And so our natural response is, I need to stop wanting expensive stuff, and then, I'll, then it'll all be sorted out, and my relationship with God will be fine again. I tried that. I tried it. And, and look, I, I've got to be honest, there were times when God gave me the strength and, and took those desires out of my heart for whatever that item was. Sure. But I was reading in Ezekiel one morning as I'm going through this whole battle in, in my mind. I don't normally read in Ezekiel. <laughs> you know, Ezekiel's not the place I hang on for morning study. You know? I think too many people spend too much time there. That's right. But here I was in Ezekiel 36, and I'm at the end of my rope when it comes to this faith versus finance battle. I have tried everything that I know how, and I'm about to give up. I'm like, Lord, this is a battle I can't win, and I'm sorry, but I can't win it. I'm trying to clean my heart and it's not working. Ezekiel 36, verses 25 to 27, they just burst out of the page at me. I have what I call an epiphany, you know, a light bulb moment. Sure. And I read it and it's Jesus, it's God there saying, Julian, I want to give you a new heart. A new heart. A new heart. I don't, you don't have to keep trying to clean this old one. The heart you were born with, man, the very fabric of that heart is selfishness. You can clean it as clean as you want, it's still but it's still selfish. selfish. <laughs> That's right. That's right. He says, I want to give you a new one. I want to take that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I'm going to wash you. I'm going to clean you. You know, all, all this beautiful language. And I'm like, really? You know, for, for me, why didn't I see that earlier? It, that could have saved like... Yeah, my initial response is, God, that could have saved 15 years That's of right. pain, you know, sure. of this whole battle. Yeah. And, and now I see it. And, I'm, and I'm, by this time, I'm on the carpet, on the floor, crying. I'm saying, Lord, I want that. I don't even know how that would happen, uh, but I, I need a heart attack. <laughs> I need a new heart. Do, a new do heart. A heart transplant, you know, do whatever it takes. And that was it. That was the new journey. And from that point forward, things got, I won't say it was super easy. And, and you know, the battle was over, victory, you know, ever since it's been fine. No, but I knew that the victory had been won. Sure, and it's a journey, isn't it? It's, it's a, a continually journey. growing. It's a day by day journey. Yeah. Every day is still a battle. My battle is not so much with finance and, and, and those sorts of issues anymore. God's, God's been in and he's, he's slayed that dragon. But there's other things, you know, the, the Satan doesn't stop. No. Satan doesn't go, oh, look, Julian was converted. 
I'm totally powerless now. I won't even try. That's right. I'll give up on him. He just keeps coming. Keeps coming. Tries and tries even harder. That's right. But we remember greater is he that is in you exactly. than he that is in the world. Exactly. And he who has begun a good work in you, Philippians 1.6. He's going to perform it. Will perform it. That's right. Will. Will. Not might. Whatever. That's right. He will. That's right. And we've just got to stay on our knees. Yeah. Amen. Hey, this has been great. We've got just a brief period of time. Parents, I think it's really difficult and we've seen this in many, many, many families rich kids, mm. you know, they can grow up, you know, it's not their fault. They've got hot and cold running everything. Mm. They can grow up with their priorities kind of out of whack. Again, we're not against wealth. God's certainly not against wealth. God blesses people with great wealth primarily so that they can raise their standard of giving, giving rather than their standard of living. Right. Yeah. How do we transmit this to our kids? Give me that briefly. We've got to do it two ways. One, we've got to, we've got to be an example. We've got to let our kids be involved in our giving so that they understand the importance that we place on that as parents, on, on, on sharing and, and not being greedy and that sort of thing. So we, and we've got to help them to do the same thing. We've got to teach them how to do that. Uh, however, we also know that the environment in which we raise them will have a greater impact on them than even our example. And so we've got to be really, really careful. If we, if we give our kids a jet-setting life, that's what they're going to want. And they're going to put everything they can into having that and maintaining that because that's, that's what they've been raised with. And so when they leave home, they're still going to want it and they're just going to go for gold, literally, <laughs> right. to, so that they can maintain that life. So I, I encourage families to simplify. You know, simplify. If, if your kids are living that, that hot and cold running everything life in this massive mansion, or, or it doesn't even have to be massive, it's just going to be bigger than other people in the street, you know, that's, it's one of those curious things, but, and if you're taking them on expensive holidays and, and all this different stuff, I'd say, hey, how about we just simplify a bit here? So that, and explain that to our children. Guys, as we look at Jesus, the, the man that we are following as Christians, as we look at Christ, we see a simple life. We see a humble, serving life. And we want to do more of that. And so we're thinking of downsizing a few things. We're thinking of downsizing, you know, that holiday we have in Aspen every year, or it could just be that holiday that we have down the road that's a bit nicer than other people's holidays. You know, we're going to pull back on that. And we're going to actually downsize our home and we're going to downsize a few things so that we can help more people. And hey, kids, check, check this out. This place sent us this thing about these people who are in real need. And do you think we could give up some things to help them? You know, you guys in on this, make it a family thing where you all come together and start to simplify some things, reduce some costs, help other people. And that way, it's going to help our children as well. Julian, I really appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time. It's God been bless a pleasure, you, John. And God bless Thank your you. ministry. I really appreciate it. Thank you. He's Julian Archer. His ministry is Faith Versus Finance. The book is Help I've Been Blessed. I'm John Bradshaw from It Is Written, and this has been our conversation. Thanks for joining us.